Hello there, Norton Campus. Uh, my name is Adam Spees, if I haven't met you, and I'm excited to continue on in our conversation in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' most extensive teaching that we have recorded uh, over three chapters in the book of Matthew. It would have taken about 20 minutes to deliver. You may be appreciative of that, but about 2,500 words, 111 verses. And the section we're going to be looking at today, Jesus knows something that he is going to be misunderstood. Have you been misunderstood? Can you think of a maybe conversation, an environment, a setting where you felt misunderstood? I remember as I was finishing my undergrad, um, I was pursuing at the time uh, business finance and feeling kind of a, a tug to consider uh, ministry and pursue biblical education. And so when that time came to look for uh, graduate school, uh, I began to kind of narrow my search with uh, seminaries that had undergraduate fraternities and sororities. I was surprised that it came out to four options within the United States. And so I began to inquire about opportunities and avenues uh, to be involved with fraternities uh, while studying uh, at seminary. And so I began applying and I had uh, a lot of experience, um, somewhat uh, leadership opportunities that I felt made me a decent candidate for uh, some of these opportunities. And so I qualified for uh, the final interview. Uh, there was this one university that will remain unnamed, uh, but uh, I went to travel and uh, I could have qualified to go there if uh either of the two opportunities panned out. First was um, an academic scholarship at the seminary, and the second was a live-in residency in the fraternity house. And I remember being one of the final candidates in my interview, and overall, I, th I thought it was going pretty well. I had people uh, from various departments, uh, Department of Education, other departments uh, from this university. And as the conversation kind of concluded, um, they asked me a, a rather direct, a kind of peculiar question, maybe. They're like, we don't understand why you want to be a live-in resident in the fraternity and go to seminary. It seems somewhat maybe incompatible to us. What I worried about was that they were concerned about uh, coarse language or uh, immorality, um, use of drinking, right? And um, what I perceived as a desire to be a subtle influence in this environment, they may have perceived to be an arrogant judgmentalism who was going to come kind of uh, make obvious what I believe in my convictions. And so I remember just trying to articulate about my experience and my love for my fraternity brothers, appreciation of them, and wanting to walk alongside of them, but in the context of that conversation, just feeling like I couldn't do so adequately or accurately. And I left that conversation knowing that uh, I was not gonna be chosen uh, for that position in that uh, role. What Jesus knows is in this section is that he is going to be misunderstood. And he makes it abundantly clear by talking about or starting with a denial. He's speaking to this group of people and he says, do not think, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and prophets, but rather I have come to fulfill them. You see this denial that he begins with, that you may assume that you may understand I'm coming to do away with the law and the prophets, which would have been their Hebrew Bible. It would have been kind of a shorthand way of talking about the writings, the writings of the law uh, and the prophets and also other wisdom literature, right? He says, do not assume, do not think I've come to abolish them, but rather to fulfill them. I wonder if there was maybe some weight in this word that Jesus had shared, abolish, right? Because that same word, the root of that word, would be used in the trial 
to condemn him to the cross. It was that word destroy that we have translated in probably most of our translations. They would accuse him of destroying the temple. It was, he, he said he could destroy it and raise it again in three days when he was talking about his body. They assumed the center of their Jewish life. Right? Jesus, in the entirety of his life, was misunderstood. They assumed he wanted to take something from them rather than offer something for him. And so he begins this section trying to clarify who he is and what he's come to do. Now, when I think of this idea of abolishing versus fulfilling, it's helped me to sense maybe a metaphor. Imagine that in front of me was an acorn. And imagine that uh, I wanted to make a change with this acorn. I could uh, abolish the acorn by grabbing my trusty hammer and uh, obliterating it to a pieces, right? So I could do away with uh, what the substance of the acorn was. But if I took that acorn and I placed it in soil, watered it with sunlight, and allowed over the course of time to become an oak tree, I have changed the core substance of this acorn. That it no longer exists in the same framework, in the same form, but it has been fulfilled in a new and different way. I believe that kind of sets just an example and illustration of what Jesus is conveying about who he is and what he's come to do. And I'd like to give us three ways in which Jesus fulfilled rather than abolished the law and prophets. The first is that he fulfilled the predictions that the law and the prophets had made. That he literally was the Savior, the coming Messiah that they had looked to that they had dreamed about, that they had read about and had been praying for. That we see that the Old Testament scriptures are very extremely specific, historically accurate in the predictions that they had made. Now, different people have come at different times. I think of uh, Nostradamus might be uh, the most famous where Uh, He would make predictions of something that were to happen in the future. But if you look closely, many of his, if not all, are vague and kind of unclear and can be interpreted uh, very differently. But when it comes to the Bible, uh, it is unparalleled in the specificity of the predictions that it makes. Take, for example, uh, Isaiah wrote uh, hundreds of years before a king would rise up from the country of Persia. That king would be named Cyrus. He predicted that, right? And not only would that king rise up in a non-Jewish area, but he would be the king that allowed and freed the Jews to go back and rebuild Jerusalem before Jerusalem was in a state of rubble. And he made these predictions 150 years before Cyrus was born, 180 before he uh, took his throne, and 110 years before Jerusalem was destroyed. You see um, how specific these predictions are. Well, there are over 300, some believe as many as 350 specific predictions about the Messiah. And they can be grouped in three categories as it relates to Jesus, right? His birth, his life, his death. And we see that only a few of these would have been very unique, but all placed together overwhelming, significant evidence that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that they had hoped for, right? When we look to his birth, It includes the place of his birth, Bethlehem, that he would be from Judah, from the line of David, the family line of David, 
that he would be born on a very unique day announced by a star. That would be like saying he would be born on our upcoming solar eclipse day. If you're a student, enjoy your day off uh, that many schools have canceled on that day. But he would also be born of a virgin, right? So many significant prophecies of his birth. But not just that, his life, that he would spend time in Egypt, that he would be a light to the region of Galilee, that he would speak in parables, that he would perform miracles where the blind would see, the deaf would hear, the lame would walk, the mute would speak, captives in the darkness would be set free. But most kind of overwhelming is the prophecies related to his death, that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, betrayed by a friend, that his money would be given to a potter, potter, that he would be forsaken by his disciples, accused falsely, smitten and spit upon, that his hands and feet would be pierced, killed with criminals, ridiculed by people, garments divided by lots cast, given gall and vinegar to to drink, friends stood far away, bones not broken, Side pierce, darkness would overtake the land at the time of his death, that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. I realized that I went quickly over many uh, predictions that we find in Old Testament scripture and find their fulfillment in the New Testament. If you're curious about this, you can email me. You can email the church. I'd love to send you this. There's a lot of references in today's conversation. But there's one chapter of Scripture that's fascinating, and we don't have time to look at the whole chapter, but in Isaiah 53, this is what it said about the coming Messiah. He was despised, rejected by mankind, a man of sufferings and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain, bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Throughout the whole chapter of Isaiah 53, A very fitting chapter to kind of immerse ourselves in as we look forward to Easter. Right, This chapter uh, has created some conflict between uh, Jews and Christians, right? Because it's a source of conversation. Um, It has been dubbed at times the forbidden chapter. Because in the cycle of Jewish readings, they would read Isaiah 52, skip over 53, and continue on in Isaiah 54. That there are very specific predictions that are only fulfilled in Jesus. So when Jesus says that he has come not to abolish, but to fulfill, there's a literal interpretation that he is fulfilling all the predictions that the law and the prophets point to related to the Messiah. But there's also this figurative aspect in which Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets. Look with me in Colossians. It says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat, drink, in regard to a religious festival, new moon, celebration, or Sabbath. He's talking about religious practices, in particular in this passage, some that the Jews observed, right? Those of a Sabbath day. And he's saying that these are a shadow of the things that were to come, that these practices serve the purpose to point to a person and that reality is found in Christ. But also we see in Hebrews that the law also was a shadow of the good things that are coming. That these practices, that the law, that the law and prophets in its entirety are shadows because they provide an idea of what something looks like without completely revealing the object. That Jesus fulfilled the law and prophets as the image of its shadows. Now, I think the best way to think of some of these shadows is 
in terms of uh, maybe grouping or characteristics, right? Because there are people, archetypes, in the Old Testament that we would see fulfillment in Jesus. And so at times we can teach these Old Testament stories and just pour out, um, pull out moral themes, right? That we can do character studies. But many of them are pictures that find its fulfillment in Jesus. First, think of people, right? That Romans compares Jesus with Adam. That the first Adam willfully followed his wife into sin that brought about brokenness into the world, that depravity was now in the DNA of men. But it says that Jesus is the last Adam who would die for his bride, the people of God, so they may be saved. Hebrews 11 talks about Abraham and the sacrifice of his son Isaac, or what would have been the sacrifice of his son Isaac. And Isaac serves as this kind of archetype for Christ that he carried wood up to his burnt offering and willingly submitted, most likely as a teenager, to be that substitute, that sacrifice, when God ultimately provided the lamb in that story. That Jesus is kind of the picture of the fulfillment, willingly submitting to God the Father on his death on a cross, carrying a wooden cross. We see that in Matthew, Jesus is compared to Jonah, right? Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, the large fish, for three days, Jesus also would be in the tomb, in the heart of earth, three days and three nights. But more than just people in the Old Testament, there's certain pictures that we see that point and find its fulfillment in Jesus. John 3 talks about Jesus as it correlates with the bronze serpent. So when Moses was leading the Israelites, right, uh, they were uh, dying from snake bites. And so we see this unique kind of picture that they uh, took a wooden stick, laid a bronze serpent horizontally across that, and they looked to that bronze serpent to be physically saved, that uh, the snake bites did not have the harm and effect, right? That the serpent could represent sin and that we look to the cross where God ultimately paid the price so that you and I could receive salvation, right? An Old Testament story, an imagery that we see the fulfillment in Jesus. We look at what Jesus said about himself in John. He says, I am the bread of life. That in the Old Testament, God provided for the Israelites for 40 years uh, with manna every evening. That he is saying, I am the one that uh, will be your provision. I am the one that is the source of your life. We see this picture that finds its fulfillment in Jesus. But also, there's a third thing. That there were Old Testament practices that are now being fulfilled in Jesus. Right? Probably most significant, at Passover, they would take a pure, spotless lamb. And they would sacrifice it year after year. And Jesus is being compared to our Passover lamb. That's what John records when they see Jesus early on in chapter 1. Look, the lamb of God is now among us. That Jesus would be the once and for all perfect substitute sacrifice so that you and I could be made right with God. That there was this um, practice that they observed that pointed to a person. But also we would see practices like circumcision, right? That Colossians would say has found its fulfillment in Christ because he helps us put off our sinful flesh. Hebrews would talk about the fulfillment of the Sabbath as a picture of the true and greater rest that is found in Jesus. And so these are some categories, some imagery that's used to show how Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and prophets, figuratively speaking. But there's one final thing that I want to 
walk through, and that's Jesus fulfilled the law and prophets by instituting a new era governed by the Spirit. We see in Jeremiah 31, uh, a very significant passage that is talking about this time. It says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. That is um, an agreement, uh, a promise between two parties. I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. He says, it will be unlike the covenant that is associated with the law, the forming of the nation of Israel that would have um, blessings for obedience and discipline for disobedience. This new arrangement, new agreement will be unlike our previous agreement. But he says, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. At that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. What a powerful last verse there, right? But he's talking about this new era that he will institute in a new covenant that will be governed by the Holy Spirit, that the law will be written on our hearts, that the Spirit will bring about conviction and understanding of truth in uh, more of a, a fuller, fulfilled way that the arrangement between God and his people will not just be of one of blessings and discipline, but rather a permanent state of relationship with the Holy Spirit now present and available and among believers. You see this new covenant, it doesn't promise that we are not gonna struggle with sinlessness, but it promises forgiveness. It is based on his finished work that he knows he has come to do, that he is establishing this new covenant. I think Jesus had this passage in mind when he's meeting with his disciples, his last supper. And he's talking in Matthew 26 when he institutes the Lord's Supper, communion that we celebrate, that this new covenant arrangement is coming through his work that he is about to do. You see, he's instituting this new era that the Holy Spirit, though present in the Old Testament, descended upon certain people for a period of time, right? That we see the Spirit hovering over creation, that God has always existed forever in perfect unity within of himself, but we were governed by the law and Jesus is instituting a new era that's governed by the Spirit. It makes me uh, think of maybe what Jesus is doing and fulfilling um, like a uh, time more recently that some of us may be aware of. I remember uh, when I received my first computer. Uh, I was a junior in high school. It was a compact presario. I was very excited about it because I could hop on AOL Instant Messenger with my friends. Um, but the computer monitors of the day, they were huge. They're gigantic. My kids just kind of laugh when they see them, right? And uh, they had, uh, the images were projected in these monitors by what was called vacuum tubes. I know that's kind of technical, uh, but bear with me for a moment. The, there would be many vacuum tubes that would burn an image that would show up on the screen. So because of the way that the monitors worked, uh, they're instituted on computers what was called a screensaver. My favorite was kind of following the 3D maze that would take its place, right? And so 
After your screen was idle for a period of time, it would kick into screensaver mode so that image wouldn't be ghosted and ultimately ruin uh, your monitor that you had with your computer. Well, as technology has advanced, we no longer are utilizing vacuum tubes, um, but rather different technology that has made the screensaver null and void, right? The screensaver does not serve the same purpose that it did once it originally started. It may be one that people choose to kick on in terms of they like the beauty, uh, they like uh, uh, looking at a different picture, but it doesn't serve the same purpose that it did then, right? That's the idea that the law and the prophets find their fulfillment in Jesus. The purpose pointed to a person. And we see this when Jesus comes and says, do not think I've come to abolish, but rather to fulfill. That he is planting that acorn in a way that they are unaware that will blossom and bloom into this oak tree that they can look back and understand. Now, I find it fascinating after Jesus kind of makes this drop the mic moment in verse 17, he goes on now to talk about the importance of scripture. He says, for truly I tell you until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Right? He's tried to correct a misunderstanding, and now he's sharing about um, the importance of their Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament scriptures. So Jesus affirms the integrity, perseverance, and value of the Old Testament scriptures. And why can we believe what is true about the Old Testament? Is because Jesus did, <laughs> right? He affirmed uh, the commands, the desires, the law, and the prophets. He quoted from the Old Testament scriptures. He believed that they had validity uh, that would impact someone's way of life, right? That we can trust in the perseverance of the word of God. A fair question you may ask or wonder is, how do we know that what Jesus had is what we have, right? We've been separated by quite a few years. Well, one of the most significant archaeological dis discoveries happened last century. In 1947, uh, about 20 miles uh, off the coast of the Dead Sea, there was a young shepherd boy. Uh, he had a runaway goat, and uh, he was searching for this goat. And so he threw a rock in a cave, and uh, he heard a noise, uh, like a crashing. And uh, he had discovered he broke a clay pot. Well, in the process of discovering this, um, he let other people know. We came to find out uh, that it was the what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, what was so fascinating about these scrolls was the amount, they had a, the Kumaran um, village that had lived and they had uh, secured uh, these on papyrus and animal skin, right? Is that these scrolls were a thousand years older than any previous manuscripts and copies that we have, dating back to 100 to 200 BC before Christ. And what was even more fascinating was that uh, every book of the Bible, uh, Hebrew Bible, was found, except I think Esther, right? And they had varying fragments, but what they didn't find was significant discrepancies. Maybe um, a letter, a, a, a little phrase, nothing with any theological bearing, right? A, a mystic, because scribes in those days took this, um, very significantly important. And so we can see the preservation, the perseverance that God has had in his inspired scriptures to trust that what you and I have today is what God intended. Now, I think a fair question may be, 
Well, how do we understand the value? Like, yes, I can believe in the integrity and the perseverance, but what's the value? Psalm would say that the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing to the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. And so what we can see is that there is great importance in understanding in particular in the law, right? But I think the fair question is, how do we best interpret the law, right? It is commonly accepted that there's three ways to kind of look at the law, right? In the Old Testament, that there were ceremonial laws, civil laws, but also moral laws that governed the nation of Israel. And so we would see that um, in Scripture, talking about restitution that one would have if they were injured by an ox, right? That would be an example of a civil law, how it would be uh, that they should govern the judges and those in charge of the nation of Israel, right? We would see cities of refuge for those that uh, should be, uh, have a fair trial, right? That would be another civil law. But there were purification uh, processes that one would have to go through. Uh, There were practices related to religious festivals, that there were certain ceremonial laws that were intended to be put in place um, so that the nation of Israel could be separate and distinct and uh, be able to articulate who God was to the rest of the known world, right? But then there are also moral laws that we see. There may be some that would be a combination of of both that are maybe harder just to put in one camp. You would see like gleaning of those who uh, were poor, right? Or uh, those who were strangers, exiles, right? That they'd be welcomed into the nation. It may have aspects of a moral law with uh, maybe some civil ramifications, right? And that's from an interpretation where we kind of come to of, well, how do we handle the Sabbath, right? It seems that the Ten Commandments, uh, Jesus summarized well, right? And so the Sabbath of being one of that Ten Commandments, well, is that a moral law or is that a ceremonial law? And fortunately, uh, we've been given the Holy Spirit, right, that can convict us on how we feel um, that we can best approach some of these uh, more um, laws that maybe how do we best interpret in uh, the understanding of the Holy Spirit. And so we look at there and we can see how people may land a little different, but significant that God's moral laws continue still to this day because in his character, He doesn't change, and we see value with the law. I heard this illustration that really helped me, that the law is similar to a thermometer. It can just show the temperature of a room, and in this case, the temperature of my heart. But the gospel is the thermostat. The gospel is what can change a heart. The gospel is the message that God so deeply loves us that he died on our behalf so that he could have a forever relationship with me. That the law uh, can do do nothing to motivate us to live right with God, but rather it points out the need for a savior. And so the law has great value of governing, of leading, of leading us to the person of Jesus. John Locke says this, it has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth for its matter. The Bible is not a list of disconnected rules or how-tos, but it rather points us to a person. And the law serves the same purpose, right? To point us of our depravity, to point us of our sinfulness and our need of reconciliation, of retribution, 
right? Jesus goes on to say, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Very strong language. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and of the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. You see, Jesus here is casting himself as the new Moses, <laughs> right? When the law was given to Moses, you have heard long ago, but I tell you that Jesus here is clarifying, giving an interpretation of God's desires, right? He is setting this kind of weightiness to the law, to our Old Testament scriptures. And in doing so, he's using this exaggeration, this hyperbole to talk about a group of people that would have been very zealous, that others would have looked to as very righteous, right? The Pharisees. They would have uh, memorized uh, much of the Old Testament scripture. They would have been meticulous in how they would have kept their laws, right? And so he's saying, your righteousness needs to surpass those of the Pharisees. The people hearing this would have thought it was impossible, right? Well, that's what he was leading them to believe, that Jesus here clarifies God's standard of perfection and need for propitiation. Yes, that's a, a theological term that probably most of us have not heard, right? Propitiation just means an appeasement, a satisfaction specifically for God. Propitiation's two-part, involving the appeasing of the wrath of an offended person, but also being reconciled to them. So what Jesus is doing is clarifying that his law is insurmountable, that he is the only one that is able to fulfill everything, that we are incapable of doing so, and that should lead us to a desire to be made right with God. And so when we look at the law and the prophets era, the nation of Israel, the law was designed to point them forward to the need of a Messiah and a Savior, the need for propitiation. We look back and we recognize that person as Jesus, that he willingly lived the perfect life that you and I were unable to, that he died in our place so that through faith, you and I could have a forever relationship with God. What is fascinating is that Jesus is not just the culmination, he's the climax of God's story and plan of redemption. God didn't interact differently with these in terms of salvation, right? It's always been by faith. That's what it says in Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed the Lord, and his belief is what was credited to him as righteousness. The same belief that you and I, when we recognize who we are, who he is, what he's done, and embrace and accept the invitation that he offers to be in relationship, it is through faith. There's nothing you and I can do in order to appease God, to satisfy him, but it's recognizing I'm incapable of doing so and that he has made the payment so that I can be in a relationship with him. Hebrews 9.15 says that Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. Those who are called may receive the promised internal inheritance. Now that he has died, listen to this, as a ransom to them set free from the sins committed under the first covenant. That for all of us, our salvation is found in the person of Jesus. 
They look forward to that day. We look backward. There's one final thing that really resonated with me in my study, and it's this kind of word picture that just made me uh, think a lot this week. It, Jesus, when he's saying, I didn't come to abolish, but rather to fulfill, makes mention of another time. He says that what we have in terms of our scripture will not disappear until everything is accomplished. What it reminds me is that Jesus is alluding to his return, that he is alluding to the time that he will be coming back again to make all the wrongs right. And we see this picture that shows his entirety of accomplishment, that from the beginning of creation, through his relationship with the law and prophets, where we find ourselves in now, within the church, as we await his return, that Jesus is coming back to accomplish all that he began. And that's to be reunited and reconciled with a fallen humanity. Do you believe that he will accomplish what he said he will do? Do you have that hope, that assurance, that there's nothing you need to do in order to have appeasement with a perfect and holy God. He has accomplished everything for your behalf. But also I think that we can live as if we abolish the law, that we disregard God's desires, that his commands that are true and lovely and would bring us life and joy and happiness that we can think we know better, right? That we can choose our own way thinking that we'll be more satisfied or fulfilled. But trusting in the God of creation, the God of redemption, the God of restoration, that he is all we need, that he is the fulfillment that you and I long for, He's the fulfillment that humanity has longed for. Father, we thank you that you do something for us that we're incapable to do ourselves. And Lord, you give us hope. You give us purpose. You give us clarity. Uh, you give us um, not just instruction, but uh, encouragement uh, to become more like you. Lord, that's our hope and prayer that we would walk with the confidence, knowing and understanding that we'll be misunderstood just like you were, but we can live most confidently being understood by you, a perfect and holy God who so deeply loved us that he gave everything for us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.